All right, I'll just start, and if anyone else shows up, then they can just follow along. So um, today I'll be talking about, I'll basically be continuing the idea. Um, okay, so today I'll be continuing the uh, lesson that we had last week. Basically, um, you don't really have to have, you don't really need to know the information from last week to understand this week, but it might help to have a bit of knowledge. So geometric optics, also known as ray optics, is the idea of using rays to model light. And the idea is that because light travels in a straight path, unless something bends it, this is just what we know about light. And for instance, if we consider like something like the sun, then it'll have rays of light emitting out in straight lines. And then of course, Earth will be over here somewhere and then the rays of light will be hitting the Earth from very far away. And this is how light reaches from the sun to the earth. It travels in straight paths. And the idea is that using these straight paths, we can use stuff like mirrors and lenses to manipulate the way light will travel. So yeah, anything that emits or reflects light, um, can we can see we can be able to we're able to see that stuff. So in this model, rays will travel in every direction to represent light traveling in every direction. So this kind of is similar to what we talked about last time with the idea of, for instance, an object like an apple. This is just going to be a very badly drawn apple. And the idea is that the apple will radiate light and it'll radiate light in all directions. It'll radiate heat, which is kind of the idea of infrared light that we saw last time on the scale of the big like uh, horizontal scale and with all the different wavelengths, all the, all the different frequencies. And the idea is that we're able to see only just a small bit of it, but everything will emit lights in all directions and it will emit light across the entire spectrum. But in this case, we'll only be talking about visible light that just applies to all kinds of light, any kind of light wavelength. So how can we manipulate light? There's three, basically three basic ways. So one, we can block it, of course, I just like blocking it, it does what you would expect. It just covers up the lights as for instance, in the solar eclipse. Um, you can also reflect it for in something like a mirror. And then something more complicated is being able to, to bend light using something such as a lens. So basically, the law of there are laws of reflection and refraction. Basically, the idea is that uh, when a wave changes its medium, for instance, if you travel from, well, actually, I'll just show you on the next slide. But basically, it says that when a ray of light reaches the boundary of two different uh, mediums and it has to be transparent or else the medium else the light would just be blocked the ray will divide into a reflected into a reflected ray and a refracted ray so um for instance in this case if you consider for something like something like a mirror then um this will be kind of the reflected light and i'll show you on the next slide the idea of like, the idea of refraction but basically for mirrors you can see how light will travel from the candlestick to the mirror, and then it'll reflect. So when it reflects and hits your eyes, then what happens is that your eye will basically see it as if it were through the mirror. Obviously, we know that it is not actually inside or across the mirror. It's just behind us over here. If like this was the person here and they were seeing through this eye, then obviously like the person would know because just from experience that mirrors reflect. So they can see the um, they can see the fact that the candles behind them. But basically, what it looks like is that the candlestick is, it's as if you're looking through glass and you're seeing an exact reflection of everything in the surroundings, including this candle. So that's the idea of a mirror, pretty basic stuff. And there's two types of mirrors. There are plane mirrors and there's spherical mirrors. And they basically behave the same way in that they just reflect lights at an angle at which, like the angle at which the light comes. So for instance, if you can see this diagram on the left, then Whatever angle the light comes at, comes at perpendicular to the mirror. So this is the perpendicular. Whatever angle this is, then it'll be equal when it reflects. So that's pretty intuitive. And there's a similar idea for other mirrors, except instead of reflecting like across this perpendicular line, you can basically think of this, for instance, if you take the top right ray, uh, light ray, it'll reflect as if there is a plane mirror that is tangent to the, the concave mirror in this case at that point. So it'll still obey this kind of idea that it'll reflect across the perpendicular, but in this case, the perpendicular will change. So in this, so for the top one, it'll be like this perpendicular. 
visitor. Um, and then it'll reflect like this. And then etc. for the other ones. So if I can, I'll delete the rest of this. And for the middle one, it'll behave normally because if you draw the tangent line, then it'll just, of course, reflect back to where it was. So light will still follow these same basic principles for any kind of mirror, but you can bend mirrors and you can manip manipulate them to create different effects, not just reflecting through the same angle. And this idea of refraction, refraction comes into play with Snell's law. The idea is that Snell's law tells us that basically um, there's two different like values here that depend on the materials. So for instance, air would have a different would have a different index of refraction than something like water. But regardless of those index indices, um, there will also be the angle component. So when you have light reaching, this is between air and this is between water. So let's say light travels like this, then when it hits the water, it'll have this angle of refraction. So this also kind of helps explain the idea of when you have something like a straw in a cup, this is a cup, this is maybe like the water or something, you have a straw inside, and when you look inside, it looks like it's bent. The reason for that part is you can attribute, it, attribute that, and you can also calculate the angle at which it'll be bent using something like Snell's law. And yeah, so we can use materials with known index of refraction like water and like air to find the angle at which say the straw will bend. And if we can measure the angle at which something bends, then if we know the uh, index of refraction of one medium, then we could find another one. So for instance, if we had some weird matter in here, it wasn't water, if it was just something like a new element, I don't know. But basically, if we already know the refraction index of air, which is all around here, then if we can measure the, measure the angles accurately enough, then we have, basically we'll have both, let's say this is an air, we'll have the angles of course, and then that allows us to solve for N2. So that's kind of a possible application we could use with Snell's law. You don't have to know this formula, this is something that I think helps demonstrate this idea of different angles of incidence. So now um, this will be a video on lenses. Um, there'll be two videos on lenses, and I think we do a pretty good job explaining it. So I'll just mute for a second. Let me be share so I can share the sound. And I'll just turn off my video and unmute so you guys can see the video clearly. And if you have any questions, just like unmute and or say something in chat, and I'll try to my best to answer it. We've talked a lot about mirrors, in particular parabolic mirrors that reflect light. Everyone's, uh, what I want to do now audio. is talk about lenses, or talk about what a lens is, and think about how they transmit or refract light. So a simple lens, and we've all seen them, maybe it's made out of glass, maybe I'll take the sounds as is each surface, and I'm going to focus on convex lenses first. So remember, concave means it kind of it, it opens inward like a cave. Convex means it kind of opens outward. And in a convex lens, it'll be symmetric. So let me see if I can draw it. So it'll be one side of the lens will look like that. And this would you could kind of view this, and oftentimes most lenses, the simpler lenses, are made this way. So this is kind of the surface of a sphere, or part of the surface of a sphere. Let me see if I can draw that a little bit better. So part of, and I could do part of the surface of a sphere, and it's symmetric. So it has some center right over here, just like that. And then you have another surface of a sphere that's exactly the same. I'm doing my best to draw this convex lens, just like that. That is pretty, that's a pretty good job here. And let me copy and paste it so I can actually use this drawing in the future before I mark it up. All right, so I've copied it. So let's think about what's going to happen as light goes through this lens, as it's transmitted through it or may, and maybe gets diffracted by it. So we're assuming this is air out here, this is glass, something that has a higher index of refraction, something in which light travels slower. So you can imagine that some light that is going parallel, that is going parallel, I guess you could view it to the principal axis of the lens. This would be the principal axis of the lens right here just like we talked about the principal axis of our parabolic mirrors. But if you imagine light that's going parallel to that, right when it hits this surface over here, remember, the, the perpendicular at this point is going to look like this, because the lens is actually curved. And remember, it's moving faster on the outside. So the right side is going to be able to stay outside a little bit longer 
or actually I should say, you know, the top side of the light, if you imagine the car analysis, car analogy is going to be able to stay out of the lens a little bit longer than the bottom side or the bottom wheels. Or if we go in the direction of the light, the left side of the car is going to be able to, and just so we can visualize the car, there's the left wheels, those are the right wheels. The left wheels are going to be able to stay out a little bit longer and travel faster a little bit longer. And so it will, so this is the perpendicular again, so it will be refracted it will be refracted downwards like that a little bit. And then once you get to this interface, now you're going to move into a faster, into a faster medium, into the air again. And let me draw our perpendicular over here. So let me draw a perpendicular over here. And you can imagine that the right side, the right side of this ray is going to the right side of this Actually, so let me be good. The left side of this ray is going to come out first. And since the left side of this ray, or the left side of these tires are going to come out first, or maybe the top tires are going to come out first, they're going to be able to travel faster. And so you'll be deflected even more downwards. So it will look, it'll look something like, it will look something like this. And the light ray, and the light ray, the light ray would do something like that. Now, there is a point out here someplace that whenever I take any ray that is parallel, any ray that is parallel to the principal axis of the lens, any ray that is parallel to the principal axis of the lens, it will be refracted through the lens to that same point, to that same point. So here we're going to be refracted a little bit like that, and then we'll be refracted more, and then we're going to go to that same point, and that'll so that's another ray. And then this is another parallel ray. It'll be refracted a little bit over here, and then a little bit more, and it'll go to that same point. And I think you could guess what I'm about to call this point. I wish I could draw my lines a little bit straighter. Let's refract a little bit, and then refract a little bit more, and go straight into that point. This point, where all of the parallel rays, sometimes you'll, you'll hear them uh, talked of as collimated rays. That is, those are rays of light that are roughly parallel. They're all when they all converge at this point on the other side of the lens. They're essentially all being focused on that point. And this right here, this right here you can view as the focus of the of the lens. Or you can view this length from the lens to that point as the focal length. Now, this lens is completely symmetric. Anything you could do from one side, you end up getting focused on the right side. If you had collimited rays or parallel rays coming from the right side, if you had parallel rays coming from the right side, the same thing would happen, but it would just be on the other side. So that ray would go like that, and then it would be refracted some more, and maybe it would go to this point. It would go to this point right over here. And so you actually have two foci for a parallel, for a sorry, for a lens, two actual points where if if parallel rays are coming from one side, they'll be focused on the point on the other side, and if parallel rays are coming from the left side, they'll be focused on at the foc at the focal length or at the focus point on the right hand side. And this goes the other way around. Let me draw another let me draw another lens. And actually, one thing that we're going to assume while we're dealing with lenses, and this is kind of a simplifying assumption, it's called the thin lens assumption. There is a difference in distance it travels depending on where the light travels in, in, in the lens. For example, here, there's less distance than over, than over here. And in an introductory physics, and we're going to do that here as well, we're just going to ignore that difference in distance, because that would lead to some differences in how uh, the light is, is refracted and transmitted, all of that, because it has to travel a, a smaller distance here than over here. So we're going to ignore those differences, and we're just going to make the thin lens assumption. But using a thin lens assumption, let's think a little bit about what's going to happen with the light. And in the next few examples, I'm not going to worry about this kind of two-step. I'm just going to say, look, it just in general gets refracted in that direction when it exits, when it exits the lens. So let me just draw a simple lens right over here. A simple lens. It is symmetric. And it has two focal points, one on this side. So that is one focal point. And then it has another focal point, the exact same distance on the other side. This lens is symmetric. So let's think about what this lens will do to the images of different objects. So let's let me draw its principal axis again. So both focal points lie along that principal axis. Now let's stick an object, let's stick an object out here beyond the focal length. 
So let's think about what's going to happen. So first, remember, we can pick any point on this object. Light is being diffusely reflected off of every point. I like to pick points that are going to do something that's kind of predictable. So let's pick a point. Let's, well, let's take the tip and take a ray that does something that's predictable. So let's take a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. And then, I mean, I could draw this two steps so it gets refracted once. And then it'll get refracted again through the focal point on the other side of the lens. So then it gets refracted through there just like that. And then I could take a, a, another ray from the tip of that arrow that goes through the focal point on this side. So it goes through the focal point on this side. And so that is going to get refracted like this and then get refracted again. So it comes out on the other side of the lens going parallel. And hopefully this makes sense to you because it's kind of a symmetric it's kind of a symmetric deal that we're dealing with over here. If something coming in parallel on the right side will go through the focal point, then something going through the focal point will come out on the other side parallel. So whatever light is coming out is radially outward onto this side and going through the lens will converge at this point right over here on the other side of the lens. And so you could do even light that goes straight through the lens would end up right over there. It actually won't be refracted at all. It'll just be able to go straight through the lens. And so the image that gets formed on the other side of the lens will look like that. So in this example, it looks like it looks like we have an inverted real image. Inverted real image. And once again, it's a real image because the light is actually converging at that point. You would actually be able to put some type of a screen and project the image there. In the next video, we're just going to practice this idea of drawing these rays to figure out what, what type of images we'll get depending where the object is, whether it's at the focal point, beyond the focal point, beyond two times the focal point, or within the focal point. And the best thing there is we'll just get a lot of practice doing this, uh, drawing these rays and thinking about how they'll get refracted. All right, so that was the video. Um, are there any questions? If not, then we'll move on. So, OK, so this kind of ties in with the idea of a magnifying glass. Um, as you saw in the video, these, this like kind of concept can be used to help increase the size of something. It could be lethal to some poor ants, it could focus the sun's rays into one spot with the idea that, say these are the rays here, shining like this. Then using the lens, then using a the diagram, um, they'll all start concentrating onto one point. And as a result, that could cause some severe damage to some very small animals. And there's another type of lens. Uh, called contact lens. This video is much shorter, a lot only about. three minutes. Uh, I'll just do the same. I think I forgot to share with sound again. But um, yeah, let me reshare. Yeah, I'll do the same thing. If there any questions, uh, please stop me. Uh, convex lenses. So I thought I would do a quick video on concave in lenses, although there aren't as many different combinations of what a concave lens can do. So just remember, concave has the word cave in it. So I always imagine that it's kind of caving inwards. Caving inwards. It's a little bit of an exaggerated drawing. But I think you get the general idea. This is a concave lens right over here. And let me draw its principal axis. So this is its principal axis. It shouldn't curve at the beginning. So let me just redraw it. So that's its principal axis. And let me draw the two focal points. Let me draw one over here on the left side, and then let equal distance a focal point on the right side. And I'm assuming that the two surfaces are they're both concave and they're symmetric over here. That's just an assumption I'm making. Now let's think about what's going to happen if I put an object, if I put an object someplace on someplace on the left side of this concave lens. So I could put it, let me just stick it anywhere. So let me stick it right over there. So if I do and like always we'll do our two rays, but 
with the concave lens, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do two rays. I'm going to do one that's parallel to the principal axis, and then I'm going to do one that does not get diffracted. So it goes right through the center of the lens. And let's think about what happens. So if we go parallel, if we go parallel to the principal axis, this will get diffracted away. Since it's coming in parallel, it'll get diffracted away. It'll get diffracted outwards so that it looks like it's coming from this focus. So it'll get diffracted in a way so it looks like it's coming from that focus. So it's getting uh, diverged outward, I guess we could say. And let me draw another let me draw another point or another ray, I should say. I'll do that in yellow. And this one's just going to go straight through the center of the lens and not get diffracted. So it's just going to go straight through the center of the lens and not get diffracted. So what will the image be here? Well, clearly these two rays don't converge, so we won't have a real image. But they do both look like they're diverging from someplace. And they look like they're diverging. They look like they're diverging from right over there. So whatever, so it'll look to an observer out here, if their eyeball is right over there, it'll look to an observer. I could draw their nose, just make it clear what the person, that who, where, where the eye is. If they look at from this side, they're going to see a virtual image of the object right, right over here, just like that. So what you're actually going to see is a virtual image of the object that is not inverted, and it's going to be smaller. It's going to look like it's closer to the lens than it really is. Anyway, that's that's all there really is to know. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot you can know about anything, but but that's the general gist of a concave lens. All right, hopefully that made sense. So just to go over this again, um, convex lenses are used in farsightedness glasses because they're able to help expand something that's close, whereas concave lenses are used in nearsightedness glasses because they can um, expand something that's far away. And these are some like, it's a very uh, common use of these lenses, very everyday use. So now we're gonna do some kind of simulation. So I'll send this link in chat and I'll give, say, like five, 10 minutes, maybe until like seven o'clock or something. And you guys can play around with this lab with this kind of simulation. I think it's it really helps um, solidify your understanding. Um, you can make stuff like rays by using the points. You can make a beam of light by dragging around and creating a beam. And then you can also make something like a point source, which gets kind of clutter y. So I just won't do that for now. But you can make a Make a bunch of mirrors. You can do something like this, and you can make different kinds of mirrors. And you can see how that works. And then you can make stuff like gla uh, glasses, um, lenses, basically, and something like a circle. And you can see how Snell's law is in action here because we can see that the um, as it, as it leaves this kind of medium, I guess you could call it, it enters this new medium of the glass, and as it leaves this one, it enters again, and you can see how the angle's changing between them. As it hits the mirror, then you reflect off the tangent line like this, and so on and so forth. So light will behave using all these rules, and you can just play around with different things here. You can play around with a blocker, see how that works, and some things can get a bit crazy when uh, you start doing stuff like this. So yeah, there's also, um, Normal lenses with the idea that we talked about with uh, this stuff, an ideal lens. And then, yeah. So, a bunch of other stuff. You can see how rays would look if you extended it. Um, this just only shows the non ray stuff. You can see how like, stuff would be seen by an observer. So, over here. And yeah. So, you can play around with this and maybe say until six or until like 7.05 or something. And then we can come back. Maybe like 703. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, just uh, say something.
All right, I think that's probably enough time. So I'll continue on with the lesson. So now we're gonna be talking a bit about uh, waves and how we can create different shapes. So a sinusoidal wave is the standard wave we've been discussing so far with the idea of like, if you like move a string up and down like this, and then that'll result in like a rope being like going up and down that kind of image. And these in general form are of the form A sine Vx plus C. You can also use cosine. You have some kind of trigonometric function that has this form. It will result in this kind of crest, amplitude, crest, amplitude, etc. Um, crest, trough, crest, trough. So there's other types of waves, of course, and that is how we get different kinds of sounds. And um, just one question I have for you guys is, do you think it's possible to create this kind of square wave, this square wave, as a sum of any amounts of sinusoidal waves? It could be an infinite amount of waves. Do you think it's possible to create a literal square? And just remember that like you can choose something like this, and you can choose something like this, and like any of anything like that. You can choose something like this, and remember that adding together would just mean like adding each value at each point in time. So if you had something like this, you had something like this, adding the same wave twice would just result in a higher amplitude. If you had something like this, and something like this, where it's opposites, then adding them would just result in horizontal line. So my question for you guys is, do you think it's possible to create this kind of square wave if you had any number you wanted of sinusoidal waves? So you can do something like this, and then like another one here or something, and then like another one here, like whatever. Um, anything you want would be possible with any configuration. Is there like a single configuration that works for this? I have one vote for no. Well, the answer actually, surprisingly, um, very unintuitively is yes, it is possible, but it's only possible with an infinite number of waves. So the idea is that I'm not going to prove it here, but you can basically take a first wave like this, try to like kind of fit it into the same like orientation of the square wave, and then you can add another wave that's something like this, something like this, where you can add it to this first one, and that'll result in this other wave. And you keep adding smaller and smaller waves. You keep adding stuff like this and stuff like this. So you can eventually like add something like this. That makes it possible for you to get a wave like this. And then repeat that process infinitely, then you can get eventually something that looks exactly like a square wave. So when you do it to infinity, it might seem unintuitive, but you can actually have this kind of infinite slope and then negative infinite slope, and stuff like that, because once you bring something to infinity, then it's possible to do this kind of infinite slope kind of stuff. So Bit of a, like a trick question, but it is technically possible with an infinite amount of sinusoids. But if the question were only a finite amount, then you would be correct in saying it's not possible. So this kind of brings up the idea of a Fourier transform. So a Fourier transform is a decomposition of a periodic function into sinusoidal functions. And that's a lot of jargon, but basically the idea is that similar to the idea of us taking a square wave and we can take a bunch of different sinusoids, we can take a bunch of waves, and we can add them together and make them equal, um, make them equal this square wave. We can do actually the reverse process of taking the square wave and dividing it into a, a bunch of other waves, into a bunch of these kinds of waves to basically get a more fundamental uh, meaning of it, because it's kind of hard to analyze this kind of wave. But if you can make a bunch of sinusoids, it'd be easier to analyze. So basically this is the idea, of, this is the reverse of our idea of superposition in wave interference. So here's an example where you can just take these three waves and if you add them together, or these in this case, these four waves, if you add them together, then you can get this. And we can deconstruct this backwards and get this. And that's basically the idea of a Fourier transform. And this is pretty useful. So for instance, um, 
a tuning fork basically does something that tunes something to a certain pitch. Basically, it just creates a, a noise. It just creates that noise and emits this very constant sound. This is a tuning forks wave. So very, very simple. It's exactly just our idea of a normal sinus wave. If, for instance, you take a violin, it would have this crazy kind of sound. And down is kind of uh, similar, just a bit reversed. And for clarinet and bassoon, it's something a bit different. Saxophone goes crazy here. Um, and all these different kinds of noise, the, the reason we're able to hear, we're able to distinguish noises between each other, the reason I can hear a violin and think, oh, that's different from a clarinet, very obviously is because of this idea of the shape of a wave. So the idea is obviously if we just had a normal wave and if all sound waves were just this one wave, then the only difference between them would just be its frequency, which would mean its pitch and its amplitude, which would be its loudness. And that isn't enough to determine the difference between something like a violin and a clarinet because violins can do a wide range of pitches and so can clarinet and both of them can also do a wide range of sounds. So in order to distinguish between them, the sound has to be transformed, transferred in another kind of way. And this last third quality of a sound wave is actually its shape. So it's a combination of all these different sinusoids and add them together allows you to create a wide variety of different kinds of waves, which will give you a wide variety of a different kind of sound. So for instance, my voice will have a different shape than your voice, which will have a different shape than a balance sound or a bassoon sound, et cetera. And this is a quick, a quick aside, but basically the way the ear works is there's a bunch of little hairs in your ear and they vibrate in response to different frequencies. So if you had a very long wave with very low frequency, one particular set of hairs in your ear would be able to vibrate according to that. Whereas if you had a very high frequency, another set of hairs would be vibrating. And this allows your brain to, to determine the difference between those two waves. So essentially your brain is performing a Fourier transform or your ears performing a Fourier transform by separating all the components of a sound into different waves, into different sinusoids. So then when it gives you information to your brain, the brain can reassemble it and can basically tell you, okay, there's this much of this frequency, there's this much of this frequency, this much of a certain other frequency, and it can add all together. And that'll create then basically the noise in your head that you perceive to be whatever sound it is. So again, I go back to the example of instruments, a violin will have a different shape than a clarinet, and those will result in different ears, different parts of your ear hairs tingling, which will result in different signals being sent to your brain, and that will result in a different sound, even if they are the same amplitude and even if they are the same frequency. So this is a Fourier transform simulation. Um, basically, I'll just paste this in chat. And we can go to this and you can kind of see the way that different shapes can appear. So if we go to the uh, sine wave, this is of course a normal sine wave, um, this is a normal cosine wave. But if we go to something like a square wave, as we saw before, this of course isn't a perfect square because there's only a finite amount of different like wavelengths here, there's only a finite amount of different frequencies. But if you allow this kind of shape to go to infinity, then you would in fact be able to create a completely square wave. Um, you can use like phase shift, which basically just means you're changing the where it is on the screen, but you're not changing the shape of it. Sawtooth is just this kind of shape. And again, you see these little um, these little ticks here where there's little tick up ticks. Um, these are just caused by the fact that it's not a perfect sawtooth because that would only be uh, similar to the idea of a square. A perfect sawtooth would only would be able to only be formed by an infinite amount of sinusoids, which just is only goes up to I believe fifty or I should say 100, I guess, if you add cosine as well. So yeah, it only goes up to this many. It's a very finite amount. But if you went to an infinite amount, then you would not see these tick marks anymore. And then of course it's cosine, and then there's also triangle wave. So this, you can see it's pretty clean. Um, it's a very clear triangle shape and it's results of just basically a bunch of these tiny waves. Uh, if you look closely, it's not a perfect triangle. I mean, I couldn't even tell the difference between this and a normal triangle, but it's not exactly a triangle because it would also, like a square, require an infinite amount of terms of the sine of the sine and cosine stuff. And yeah, that's you can like try messing around with this. You can see how changing one of these would work, and you can see like and mess around with it, and you can see like 
if you hover over one, you can see what the wave is and you can change the component of it. So clearly as I change this further and further, it gets further and further from being a square. If I change it back to what it was, then it's very close to a square. So I'll give you guys say like five minutes to play around with this and you can see how do things work. You can see how other some other uh, things work and yeah.
Okay, I think it's probably enough time. So I will continue. There's only one slide left. It's just another simulation. How to send it in chat. This isn't too in depth of a simulation. This is more of a game, it takes a bit to load. Basically, the idea of the game is that well, I'm, I'll just explain while it's loading. Basically, it just gives you a wave. I'll just show you right here. Okay, first of all, it just uh, you can see how it's kind of similar to the last lab. I'm not going to bother explaining too much of this, but basically, you can see how um, this is going to be like you can see each individual wave here. Like this is the orange one, this is the red one. The more uh, further in the rainbow, I guess, be the way you put it, the more further in the rainbow you get, the higher the frequency, the lower the wavelength, which we can see individually here on this, on the harmonics. And then the sum is here, and you can see how messing with each uh, different value would change the harmonic, um, would change the sum, messing with each harmonic. So doing this allows you to see all the certain shapes. And then there's a game here that basically there's, there's 10 different levels. Um, you can choose whichever level you want, let's say five, or let's say like two or three or something. Basically, um, the goal of the game is to match uh, whatever thing you're drawing here to the shape. So I can see here that I want to find a uh, wavelength that matches this. So we can see that the yellow one is the one that matches it. And then if I try it like this, then I win because I'm able to match the shape to this function. Maybe level five is a bit harder or something. Um, try something like this. I don't know. I'll just mess around with it a bit. A bit. Something like this. I don't know. This, this, these levels are harder. But um, yeah, you can, you can see how this game plays. And you guys can just mess around with this if you want. I think like something like level 10 would just be like basically impossible. I'm not sure how you would ever solve this like without a without actually maybe either doing the math or getting a hint. If you can get a hint, you can get like hints and you can see each of the values. And then you can cheat and you can find the actual values. And you can see what the values are that you need to match. So for instance, A11 is 40. So I'll just go to 40 here. Or I can just put in 40. And then, yeah, you can just go through all of them and cheat if you really want to. I wouldn't recommend going to level 10 because it just seems impossible. But, but yeah, you can try other levels. And you can see how the game plays. And aside from that, there's not really much else I have to say. Um, is there any questions? Or are there any questions? Um, if not, then you guys are free to go. Um, you guys can sit around and play with Slap if you want, or you guys can just leave. Um, I'll just end the Zoom here. Bye. You're most welcome.